Act of the Blade Warlock, one of Baldur's Gate 3's best Spellblade style character builds, and luckily for us, it's very easy to pick up and use effectively, while also having enough utility and variety of tools to keep you from ever getting bored. The Blade Lock has something to offer players of any skill level. You will get a bunch of very powerful crowd control spells, you'll have decent survivability, and very respectable damage numbers from any range on the battlefield. There is also quite a bit of flexibility to the build itself, so if you see a spell or optional upgrade that looks like it would be more fun to try out than one of the ones I suggest in this video, you should absolutely try it out and see which one you like better. Very few parts of this build are set in stone. When you create your character, there are a couple of races that have bonuses that will benefit this specific build, such as shield dwarfs because they get light armor and medium armor proficiency, and that medium armor proficiency will help you out quite a bit as a martial character standing up close and personal in these fights. Or you can choose Gith Yankee, and you will also get access to medium armor proficiency, as well as a few items in the game that have additional bonuses if used by a Gith character, and a lot of those things work out pretty well for this build. So if you're willing to play a Gith, they are probably the best race for this build. Statistically speaking, none of y'all are going to pick either one of those two races, so this will work just fine with humans, half-elves, elves, and tieflings as well. Just know that you're going to be a little bit less tanky with some of those races, but that's just fine. As far as the level 1 build goes, we're going to choose Warlock as the class. We will choose Eldritch Blast. This is a must-have pretty much for every Warlock build. This is one of the single best spells in the game once you buff it up with all the things you're going to get while you're leveling. And it's a cantrip. You can cast it unlimited times for free. Minor Illusion is another fantastic cantrip that you can use to distract enemies before combat, positioning them into better areas because they'll go investigate the illusion and you can get them to group up and then drop something on them or shoot a fireball on top of a bunch of grouped up enemies and it works out really well. We're going to go with the Fiend subclass. This is going to grant you temporary hit points whenever you kill somebody. This is nice to have, but this is not the main reason why we're going this route. You're going to get access to quite a few awesome spells because of the Fiend subclass. The other two are not bad either. You can go with either one of these, but for this build, I'm going to choose the Fiend. As far as spells, I'm going to go with Command, which is one of the single strongest crowd control spells in the whole game and as a warlock when you level up your spells automatically upcast themselves to the most powerful version that you can possibly cast and for command that means you're going to be able to cast it on more and more targets as you level up this is fantastic to have you're definitely going to want it hex is a great early game spell that we're going to use until about level five when we replace it with some stronger stuff if the target that is hexed dies, you can recast it on somebody else for free, basically, with just a bonus action. It's really nice. It adds extra damage to your hits. Very, very nice to have in the early game, especially. The background you choose is not a massive deal. You can pick whatever you want here. I'm just going to leave it on Acolyte for this build. It's going to work out just fine. As far as stats go, I'm going to set them at 8, 14, 16, 10, 10, and 16. Dexterity, Constitution, and Charisma are your main stats, with Charisma by far being the most important for this build. Constitution is nice to have because it'll help you maintain concentration on your spells, as well as increase your health when you level up. As far as your skill proficiencies go, none of these is really game-breaking, so it doesn't really matter what you choose here. You can pick whatever you want. If this character is going to be your party's face, your conversation character that does most of the talking, Deception and Intimidation are both great choices. These can both help you out in different dialogue situations. I'm going to go ahead and go with those. But like I said, if you want to pick one of the other ones, it's not a big deal. Go ahead and choose whatever you want there. For the first few levels of playing this character, you're going to be casting Hex on a target. And then either blasting them with Eldritch Blast or hitting them with whatever weapon you have equipped. And you can see over here in the actual combat log, my Eldritch Blast only did three force damage on its normal damage roll and then because i cast hex on that target he took an additional six damage 
So me casting Hex on that target tripled the damage of this shot from three to nine. And then because of the way Hex works, you can reapply it next turn on somebody else for a bonus action because I don't have any spell slots left. I used my one spell slot to cast this. Well, one of the reasons why this is such a good spell to use is because as long as you maintain concentration, you can just keep casting it for free on another target when the first one dies. It's awesome. So now on my next turn, I can just recast Hex and then Eldritch Blast this guy. And that time it didn't triple the damage, but instead of only doing six force damage, it did 11 total damage. So it almost doubled the damage of that shot. Playing a Warlock as your main character is awesome. There are multiple different Warlock specific dialogue options like this that may get you through a situation more easily. Sometimes they don't have good outcomes. Sometimes you say something stupid and you end up getting blasted for it, but it's cool to have those different options and Warlocks have some pretty cool ones. When you get to level two, you're gonna get to choose another spell and I'm gonna go ahead and pick Armor of Agathis for this one. This is a really good defensive and offensive option you can use. And it might not sound like it's doing much, only giving you five temporary hit points. But if you look over here, you can see that my guy only has 19 health total. So an extra five on top of 19 is a huge percentage of extra health. As you level up, this buff will get more powerful and it will do more damage to attackers when they hit you. This is a very, very nice spell to have. As far as Eldritch Invocations go, it really depends on what race you decided to go with. If you're playing a Githyanki or a Shield Dwarf, like I mentioned, you don't necessarily need to take Armor of Shadows as soon as possible. You won't need to take it at all because you're going to have access to medium armor. Any Warlocks who did not go Githyanki or Shield Dwarf, you might want to consider taking Armor of Shadows at level 2, and then you can wear robes and increase your armor value quite substantially with this buff pretty much for free. And you also get the excellent effects of some of the robes you're going to be able to find in the game. It's up to you though. If you don't want to take Armor of Shadows, you want to go some other way, just know that you're going to be squishier than if you took this and wore robes and buffed yourself. You can go with Devil Sight to allow you to see in magical and non-magical darkness, which is fantastic. You can take Repelling Blast also, which makes your Eldritch Blast push people away. There's a lot of different options here, but I'm going to go with Agonizing Blast and Armor of Shadows for this build. Even though I am playing a Githyanki, I'm going to show you what I recommend no matter what race you're taking. You also have the option to trade out one of the spells that you've already learned with a spell that you you have not learned from the same list that you always have available. This is optional and sometimes it's going to be a good idea. Right now we're going to keep what we've got. Because of Agonizing Blast, Eldritch Blast is now pretty much your definitive most powerful attack. It sounds great. It freaking hits like a truck. It's, it's awesome. You're going to love it. Don't forget to reapply your hexes and keep on blasting. Level 3 is where this build really starts to come online and you actually start to feel like the badass Spellblade character you wanted to make in the first place. Don't get me wrong, Eldritch blasting people from across the room is freaking sick, but now you have more options. First of all, you get to choose another spell, and for this one, I'm going to take Cloud of Daggers. You'll notice that this is another concentration spell, which means that we cannot cast it and Hex and maintain concentration on both at the same time. So make sure that you're not casting Hex if you have a Cloud of Daggers up that you're not trying to get rid of, and vice versa. But Cloud of Daggers is a fantastic spell, and you're definitely going to get quite a bit of use out of it. And for the Pact Boon, this is probably the most important choice you're going to make on this whole character. You need to choose Pact of the Blade for this build. This is going to allow you to either summon a Pact Weapon, which is essentially a magical weapon that you summon from hell or wherever you get your pact from. Or, more importantly, it will allow you to bind whatever melee main hand weapon you are currently holding as your pact weapon. It will make that weapon's damage magical, and it will use your charisma modifier instead of strength or dexterity like a normal weapon would to determine your attack rolls and damage rolls. This means that our charisma is going to 
be making our dialogue checks better, our intimidation, persuasion, all those things. Your spells are going to deal more damage and they're going to be easier to land on targets. And also now your weapon's going to hit harder as you raise your charisma. So you're basically triple or quadruple dipping on one stat for like 50 different benefits. The coolest part about being able to bind pack weapons is that no matter what weapon you bind, it gives you proficiency with that weapon. So as you can see right here, I'm not proficient with scimitars. So equipping this weapon would be a very, very bad idea under normal circumstances because my character is going to have a very hard time hitting people with it and it's going to do less damage when I land hits. Now let's bind it as my packed weapon. And you can see now it's four to nine damage and I am proficient with it. So now it's going to add my proficiency bonus to the attack rolls. It's a big deal. And it's using my charisma modifier to buff the damage instead of dex. So now it's plus one more damage. At level four, we're going to get to choose another cantrip. And for this one, I'm going to go with Bone Chill. This is a cantrip you can cast that will prevent the target from healing until your next turn when you land it on them. There are a few fights in this game where the targets will actually be actively trying to heal and you can just completely shut that down with one cast of this spell. It's great. But feel free to take friends if you want extra options in your conversations. Just be aware that in the higher difficulty settings, this can get you caught. People can realize you're casting it on them and they will not like that. Mage Hand is also not a bad option and neither is Blade Ward. So feel free to take any of these. These are not game breaking choices. Eldritch Blast is the only cantrip you're ever going to care about. And as far as spells go for these very early levels it's kind of tough you can take darkness and hide in and out of darkness you can use this to get away from targets it's a very powerful tool and you can actually build an entire warlock build around darkness the problem is it will make some combat situations more difficult for your party members if they themselves are not built for darkness so if you're not going to build your whole group for darkness it's nice as a tool to have but i wouldn't focus mainly on it misty step is always good to have because mobility is fantastic in this game mirror image is a strong defensive cooldown you can use i'm gonna go ahead and choose hold person this is a very strong crowd control ability that you're gonna want to have pretty much all the way through the game so we're gonna take it now and as far as our first feat i'm gonna put this one in ability improvement and put two extra points in charisma and the reason for that is because we are gaining so many bonuses from charisma that those two points right now are gonna get us a ton of value over the playthrough of this game level five is where another huge chunk of bonuses come in first of all the deep impact passive is going to give you extra attack as long as you're using a packed weapon from this point forward so now for every action you can make two attacks with that super buffed charisma weapon we're going to get to choose spells and now you have access to the level three spells and i'm going to go ahead and tell you hunger of hadar is pretty much a mandatory choice at this level you are absolutely going to want this spell it is so freaking strong in this game it's not even funny and then since this is going to be pretty much the only thing we're going to be concentrating on under most situations I'm going to go ahead and swap out Hex and get Fireball. So now we're getting access to Hunger of Hadar and Fireball at the same level, and it's only costing us Hex. You also get to choose another Eldritch Invocation at this level, and I'm going to go ahead and pick up Devil's Sight for this one. This gives us 80 feet of non-magical and magical dark vision. Alternatively, if you don't want to take Devil's Sight right now, you can take Repelling Blast and make it to where your first Eldritch Blast shot on a target for that turn will knock them backwards 15 feet. And this is a toggleable feature, so you don't have to knock them back if you don't want to. Just make sure you remember to toggle it off if you don't want to. At level 6, you're going to get access to the Dark One's Own Luck ability, which will allow you to add a 1d10 to an ability check. This can be used in conversation, and it is very, very powerful to have. You also get to choose another spell, and for this one, I'm going to take Counterspell. Counterspell is one of the most powerful spells in the game because you can use it to stop an enemy from killing you if you know they're about to. 
If your enemy is getting ready to cast some giant, fat, juicy crowd control spell on top of your party members, you can just shut that down and save your party's life by using this spell slot to cancel theirs. Warlocks don't have that many spell slots per combat encounter, so you really don't want your warlock to be the one counterspelling bad effects like this, but you do want your warlock to be able to counterspell one if they need to. So we're definitely going to pick up counterspell for sure. At level 7, we get to choose another spell, and I'm going to pick Wall of Fire for this one. And you want to know why? Because it's friggin' sick to be able to summon a Wall of Fire across the room and burn a bunch of your enemies with it. It's fantastic. That's why we're playing this game. Just take Wall of Fire. It's sick. You're going to love it. Just make sure you don't cast it underneath yourself and burn yourself because it requires concentration and you'll instantly break your concentration sometimes. And then you just look like a fool. You also get to pick another Eldritch Invocation at level seven. And for this one, we're just going to take the one we didn't take last time. So if you picked up Repelling Blast last time, take Devil's Sight this time. You're going to want both of them, so just take whichever one you don't have yet. At level 8, we're going to be able to choose another spell, and for this one, I'm going to take Scorching Ray. This spell is a way that you can rapid fire off a bunch of fire damage attacks on various targets, and it's actually going to cast more rays than it says in the description, because you're a warlock, you're going to be upcasting it on accident, and it's going to be like pew pew pew. And then for our second beat... We're going to take Great Weapon Master. You don't have to go this route if you don't want to use a two-handed weapon, but you get quite a few bonuses, especially if you're playing a GIF. There's all kinds of two-handed GIF swords that will activate these effects, but if you're not playing a GIF, this is still a great choice because there are a ton of two-handed weapon options in this game that are very, very powerful for this build. Basically what this does is whenever you land a critical hit or whenever you kill a target with a melee weapon attack, it's going to allow you to make another melee weapon attack as a bonus action that turn. That's very powerful because one of the things this specific spec doesn't do very well is take advantage of bonus action. Actions. Well, with this, you can. There's also a toggleable effect that reduces your accuracy a little bit, but increases the damage of your hits. You can choose. Having options is always good. At level 9, we're going to get to choose another spell, and for this one, I'm going to pick Cone of Cold. This is going to be a large frontal cleave attack that does cold damage to everybody you hit with it. It's also a constitution save, which is not what you normally use. Most of the stuff you do is dex save. So if you're fighting an enemy with lower constitution than dexterity, your odds of getting the full effect of the spell would be higher with this one. But if you don't want to take Cone of Cold, you can also very easily justify taking Flame Strike. And let me tell you, ladies and gents, Flame Strike is freaking badass and you're going to love it. So either one, take one of these spells. As far as the Eldritch Invocation choice goes, I'm going to take Minions of Chaos for this one. You're going to get access to a few very powerful elementals that you can summon that will very, very drastically change the way that your combat situations go. If you do not want to take Minions of Chaos, you can always go with Otherworldly Leap, Beast Speech, or Mask of Many Faces. Pretty much any of these ritual spell options that you can cast as many times as you want per day, they're always great to have. You probably have access to most of these spells from other sources by now anyway, but they're always cool to have. Alternatively to that, Dreadful Word for the Confusion spell, or... Mire the Mind for Slow are both very, very powerful. You can also summon minions using scrolls if you happen to find the scrolls necessary to do that. And if you have them, I recommend using the scrolls. That way you can save your spell slots for crowd controlling targets or getting off more fireballs per combat, basically. At level 10, you're going to get to choose another cantrip. Blade Ward, Mage Hand, Friends, any of these that you haven't chosen yet are fair game. Like I said, the cantrips are not super important. As far as spells go, if you chose Flame Strike last level, you can take Cone of Cold this level or vice versa. And don't forget about Hold Monster also. This is another fantastic crowd control spell you definitely would not be upset to have. You also are going to get access to Fiendish Resilience at level 10. 10 that allows you once per short rest to choose a damage type from 
any damage type in the game and get resistance to it. You can only have resistance to one type of damage from this source at a time, but you can cast this on your turn in combat and it doesn't take an action or a bonus action. It's a free action to use. This is one of those rare buffs that you're supposed to cast on yourself every time you do long rest, but if you forget, it's not that big of a deal. You can cast it right at the last second and still be fine. At level 11, we're gonna get another spell slot, which is a massive deal. This is our third and final spell slot, which means we can now cast 50% more spells per day this doesn't sound like much, but it's a big deal. You're gonna notice this. You also get to choose what is called a Mystic Arcanum spell. Instead of getting actual access to level six spells like sorcerers and wizards do, warlocks get to pick one of these. This is a level six spell and you can cast it once per long rest, but it does not cost the spell slot. You're free to pick whatever you want here, but I'm gonna go ahead and tell you Flesh to Stone is not that great, and Circle of Death has such a huge area of effect that you can actually kill half your team with it if you're not careful. It's still not bad to have if you want to take Circle of Death and just have a big nuke, that's fine. I like Create Undead if you just want to set it and forget it. Summon, like we talked about before, it does Pretty good damage, just be aware you're gonna have to have a corpse to summon this thing. Eye Bite is a great crowd control effect, and if you can maintain concentration on it, you can actually cast multiple crowd control effects on a bunch of different enemies. So you can shut down the whole team one at a time with this. That's the problem. It only affects one target at a time, and you have other crowd control effects that can do better than that. I like Arcane Gate. This allows you to create two portals and you can just walk right through them, teleport from one portal to the next. You can use this in open world exploration if you just want to teleport your whole group across a fallen bridge or whatever. It's nice to have for that. Or in combat, you can set these up and use them to put distance between your group and your enemies or get your group closer to the enemies, whatever you need. It's fantastic for mobility. So like I said before, pick whatever you want here. I'm going to choose Arcane Gate because there's a little bit of utility built in. Don't feel bad about choosing one of these other ones though, except for Flesh to Stone. Don't choose that one, it sucks ass. And then we're gonna choose Hold Monster if we haven't already. This is a great spell, you're definitely gonna want it. And finally, ladies and gents, when we reach level 12, we are gonna get another Eldritch Invocation, a spell, we can replace a spell like always, and then you're gonna get to choose another feat. I'm gonna show you the feat choice first. We're gonna put two more points in Charisma, and the reason I'm doing that first is because the Eldritch Invocation we're going to choose at this level is called Life Drinker. Attacks made with your Pact Weapon deal additional necrotic damage equal to your Charisma modifier. What the F does that mean? Okay, over here on my character's stats on the right side of the screen. If I hover over Charisma, now that we have 20 points in it, because we just added those last two points right here, now that we have 20 points in that, you see this plus five right here? That is our Charisma modifier. So every time you hit a target with your Pact Weapon now, it is going to add plus five necrotic damage. That's not one to five, it is a plus five. Five necrotic. That right there might not sound like much damage, but let me go ahead and tell you that is a freaking huge amount of damage you're going to be adding. This is a big deal, and it's the main reason why level 12 blade lock is such a viable class. So 100% at level 12, you are absolutely going to want to choose Life Drinker for this build. As far as spells go, really choose whatever you want. You already have all the stuff you need to make this build work. If you want to take Blindness for more crowd control, it's a nice one to have because it's a constitution save and it doesn't require concentration. It's going to let you cast this on multiple targets now that you're a high level warlock. And if you land Blindness on multiple targets, you don't have to maintain concentration. So then you can lay down a freaking hunger of Hadar around them or Wall of Fire around them, whatever, just know that Hunger of Hadar also blinds targets that are inside of it. Hellish Rebuke is actually really cool. You can retaliate against somebody that hits you. It's basically like holding up a giant flaming middle finger and blasting him in the face with it. But anyway, choose whatever spell you want. I'm going to go ahead and pick Blindness. You guys take whatever you want here. 
the main important thing is getting your charisma to 20 and getting your life drinker eldritch invocation at this level. The actual moment to moment gameplay of this build can be relatively simple or it can be nuanced and complicated depending on which spells and eldritch invocations you chose as you were leveling up. If you went with the ones that I suggested in the video, you're going to have a decent amount of damage spells a decent amount of crowd control spells, and then darkness you can use to hide your party, arcane gate for mobility, and definitely don't underestimate the strength of some of these concentration spells. Cloud of Daggers, Hunger of Hadar, and Wall of Fire are all fantastic spells. And basically, at the end of the game, what you're going to want to do is be concentrating on a powerful spell of some kind. So either drop confusion on a group of enemies, or hold person on a bunch of dudes, or hold monster on one person, whatever you want to do, or just throw Hunger of Hadar or Darkness on top of a group of enemies, and then you can run in there and start chopping people up with your weapon, you can Eldritch Blast into it with your buffed Eldritch Blast, or you can just start dropping fireballs on top of them till you're out of spell slots, and then run up and start hacking them to pieces. Even though you have a limited number of spell slots per combat encounter, you're only ever going to have three, not counting the ones that you might get from gear pieces and stuff like that. You will end up finding gear pieces that give you access to more spell slots per day. And also you will find some gear pieces that increase your armor class. And I recommend looking into those things when you find them, see if it's the best fit for your warlock. Because like I said at the beginning, depending on what race you decide to go with, this build might be a little bit squishy. And you may want to mitigate some of that by increasing your armor class through other pieces of gear. In order to toggle on and off the toggleable features that I mentioned, if you come here to your actual spell book, page down here are the passives that you can toggle on and off so dark one's own luck i usually don't use this in toggleable form i'll usually use this in dialogue options but you absolutely could repelling blast is a fantastic one to put down here and the great weapon master all in repelling blast if you don't want your eldritch blast to push targets back you want to turn it off so that it doesn't have the thing spiraling around it and then same deal with this the great weapon master all in you can see that with advantage my hit chance on this target is 91 percent because this is currently nerfing my accuracy if i turn it off 99 percent so on this target i'm absolutely going to use this you can make the decision yourself on a case-by-case -case basis if you're down in like the 30s or 40s on accuracy percent for a hit then sometimes you're better off just toggling this off landing a hit for less damage in the long run great weapon master is a massive overall damage buff so if you want to just turn it on and leave it on you can i like having the option for each individual attack how the character plays make sure you have a weapon bound as your packed weapon you can see right here packed weapon this is permanent now when the game first came out you had to redo this every single day and people were complaining like crazy because if you forgot to bind your packed weapon and then you entered combat you couldn't bind it and then your warlock could be totally worthless for that combat encounter as far as melee attacks go anyway and it just wasn't good now it's permanent and there's other annoyances that come from that but overall it's better this way all in all though make sure you have a weapon bound as your packed weapon and then you can just run up and start chopping people up you see the extra five damage that it did from life drinker and you see the extra attack for a bonus action that just procced from me killing a target with great weapon master let's do command grovel my guys are modded to be higher level than they should be at this point in the game, so I'm able to target more characters than you will be able to at this time. But it doesn't matter. You could do command on one or two targets, and it's still a fantastic spell. Imperial. Imperial.
fell them all to grovel. They went prone. Can't move or take actions, bonus actions or reactions. Has disadvantage on strength and dexterity saving throws. Attacks against the prone creature have advantage if they're made within 10 feet. And it has to spend half of its next turn's movement speed to stand up. Which is fantastic. That's all really, really good. So now all these guys, watch this. So they just missed their whole turn. My one guy used his one spell slot, shut down four enemies, and skipped their turn entirely. And I don't think I need to explain to you guys in a turn-based game how freaking powerful it is to skip skip your enemies' turns. Yes, obviously killing all of these guys in one turn is the best option, but sometimes you're not playing a build that allows you to do that, and having a crowd control character in your group is massive if your damage is not high enough to just burst the enemies down in one turn. Having access to confusion, hold person, command, all these things on top of Flame Strike, Cone of Cold, these badass damage spells. I mean, we've got Darkness. Like I said, you can drop this down. And then your guys have Devil Sight, so you can see through the darkness. You get advantage on attacks while they have disadvantage. So it is a massive, massive buff playing like this. Now my guys are getting advantage on all the people that are in the darkness, or if I was in the darkness and they were outside the darkness, I would still have advantage on attacks against them. It's crazy how powerful this gameplay style is. So if you want to go this route, this is definitely a viable option. Boom. Boom. And each time you kill a target, it is going to give you temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier and warlock level combined, which is 5 plus 12. And you can see that I have 17 temporary hit points that replenish every time you kill somebody. 17 hit points might not sound like much, but my guy's max health is 99. So this is pretty much a 17% increase to his max health. Very, very powerful. So, like I said before, Travelers, there's not many parts of this build that are completely set in stone. There are huge portions of it that you can change, and it's still going to be perfectly viable. 12 levels of Blade Lock on any of the subclasses. Doesn't matter if you go Fiend, you're going to lose access to some of the spells if you do, but you'll get access to other ones. So, there's various different ways you can play this. This build also works very well if you're using Will as the character, which makes sense because he is pretty much a fiend blade lock so he'll work great for this build if you want to use him that's just fine if you're willing to play a gith yankee or a shield dwarf like i mentioned at the beginning those are probably the best options with gith being probably hands down the best but like i said before also just play whatever you want if you want to play a freaking half orc do it if you want to play a human do that too that's fine let us know down in the comments what you think about the build what other builds would you like to see covered and feel free to come join us on the discord which will be linked in the description of the video as always travelers i am glad you get to see me do your best to stay alive out there until next time See ya.